This rusted hulk is a veteran of the greatest tank fight of all time, the Battle of Kursk. Meet the ferocious German-built elephant, later salvaged from the bloody Italian campaign at Anzio, then almost left behind in history's garbage can. So rare, no tank collector will ever own one, no matter how much they spend because there's only two left in the entire world. Now, an American crew will bring this German war machine back to life. But it's going to be a tough haul. This is the largest vehicle we've had, surely the most heaviest. This tank crew will learn that big machines cause big headaches. On a cold spring morning at the U.S. Army Ordnance Museum in Aberdeen, Maryland, they get ready to move an elephant. An elephant deep in slumber for the last six decades. A Second World War Panzerjager, or tank hunter. A machine so big, she had two names. First known as the Ferdinand, and then the Elephant. 65 metric tons dry. 71 tons when combat loaded with ammo, fuel, and oil. A devastating 88 millimeter gun. One of the largest weapons put on any tank during the Second World War. One of Adolf Hitler's super weapons built to win. This is the biggest tank that we've done so far. Everything is twice as heavy as what you know we normally are working with. She's had to wait in line while other military vehicles get brought back to their former glory. Finally, she got her turn. With such a massive beast, only another heavy metal monster can get it into position. Well, when they first called us to go get the elephant tank, they needed a group effort, so we had to get recovery because we don't have the vehicles to be able to pull that type of a vehicle. The recovery vehicle is an M88A2. They're designed specifically to recover disabled tanks from the battlefield, even under enemy fire. Moving them in is always a a neat experience. The elephant has spent over 60 years in a no-man's land, exposed to the elements. Well, for a long time our elephant tank has been sitting up at a railhead because it's been so difficult to move. But she never got turned into scrap. After the war, she was shipped to the U.S. Army Ordnance Museum. For a beat-up tank destroyer, there is no safer haven. The United States Army Ordnance Museum has in its collection some 240 objects. A lot of folks don't understand that ordnance encompasses not just uh, artillery and, and the projectiles that come out of the artillery, but tanks, armored personnel carriers, and the fact that ordnance goes back to the 14th century and even earlier. What we've got here is a uh, just a portion of our ammo collection here at the Ordnance Museum. You can see many examples of uh, shells dating from the 19th century up to the present day, essentially. To preserve and share this incredible history, the Ordnance Museum has pulled together a first-class crew. These guys never met a tank they couldn't turn into a shiny museum piece. When I retired, I got a job here working with tanks, which that's about all I know. A mechanic in the U.S. Army for over 20 years, Jerry Kendrick is the project manager. Anthony Beard is a welder and sheet metal mechanic. Joe Wheeler is the head man in the paint booth. Joe is backed up by Leroy Sims and Rich Warner. And this tank crew works in a unique place, right next door to a U.S. Army testing ground. 
Sometimes, just trying to get an interview is a challenge. Hey, there's a war going on, what can I say? <laughs> With the elephant in place, the crew has a massive challenge on its hands. She is the biggest tank they've ever dealt with. The plan is to remove the tracks, strip her of decades of rust, repair, repaint, and return her to a place of honor in the Ordnance Museum's static collection. And they've been given just five weeks to do it. Along the way, the team will discover how this tank met its end and fell to Allied hands. It looked like a terrible mess. Parts were missing off of the deck. Uh, the sprockets were all tore up. Uh, it received a lot of battle damage. We weren't sure about anything that was going on with it. Uh, a lot of flaking, rusty paint. The fenders themselves were, were, were literally just pieces. Somebody had made some scrap pieces and put on to, to simulate a fender. The road wheels seemed to be in pretty good shape, and, but the track was extremely rusty. Small wonder this elephant looks so battle-scarred. She saw action in two epic battles, Anzio, Italy in 1944, and before that, the greatest tank battle of all time, the Battle of Kursk. The Battle of Kursk was, beyond a shadow of doubt, the largest tank battle ever. I mean, this is the quintessential tank battle of, this is the mother of all tank battles. 1943, the Eastern Front. Two years after Germany invaded Russia, the two countries were locked in a death struggle. German forces had suffered their first major defeat at the nightmare of Stalingrad. Now they were regrouping for revenge. In western Russia, the city of Kursk lies at the heart of what is known as a salient or bulge in the Russian-German lines. The Germans were determined to break through. The Battle of Kursk is, is literally the last opportunity the Germans are going to have to launch an offensive. The Germans assemble a staggering fighting force. 900,000 troops, 2,700 tanks. The Russians would face them with 1,300,000 troops and roughly 3,600 tanks. In the looming battle, Germany introduced a brand new superweapon, an absolutely massive tank weighing in at over 65 tons. The frontal armor, together with add-on plates, was almost 10 inches thick. She carried a crew of six, including two loaders to feed the thunderous 88mm gun. The elephant was also supposed to be one of these sort of wonder weapons that would defeat Soviet armor from a distance. It's KWK-43 main gun, which fired this enormous round at an enormous uh, velocity with a penetration of over seven inches or so. Easily defeat any Allied tank in World War II with firing this round. Basically, the 88 shell would go right through a Sherman armor plate. You could knock out a, a Russian tank at 2,000 meters with this. The team's first assignment in the elephant restoration is to remove the set of tracks. None of it is going to be easy. You look at that track, you think, oh, I'll just move that. And you, you don't move anything by, you know, just by hand. One of the basic challenges of this German elephant tank was the weight and size of the vehicle. Usually when we work on a tank, we're able to move it in and out of the booth especially when we're putting on tracks. This German elephant, we had to make one move into the booth, and it, that's where it stayed. There's no elephant manual or guidebook to follow. They've got to rely on their experience, guesswork, and luck. Well, this vehicle here is, is so large and big that it's going to be very difficult to take the track off. One thing, we don't know how it comes off. We don't know how the slack adjusters work if it even has any at all. To be able to lift it up in the air, I'm not sure what's going to happen, uh, what size jacks I'm going to need, how I'm going to have to crib it up. At this early stage, they're going to use a rivet buster to force the pins out of the track. Yeah, now it's going to get noisy. 
It produces about 30 kilos of force per hit and can generate 800 hits per minute. But the elephant doesn't seem to notice. Even with the river buster's crushing force, the pin is not coming out. Spray it. It moves about an eight. Really? Starting to try to mushroom on the end. We don't want to mushroom it out. Sometimes we've had them to where it took us a couple hours to do it. Sometimes they come right out. I think that's it, Rich. It moved a little bit. We'll go back to this side now. You rock it back and forth and lubricate it. Hopefully the fluid's going to go in, get into the pin, and let things start moving freer each time. Some of them are really tough. I mean, we ain't got to the other side yet. That might be... The team is using up valuable time on the track removal. They've got five weeks to restore this massive tank destroyer. Coming up, Jerry and his guys find out the hard way what six decades of rust does to the tank truck. At the U.S. Army Ordnance Museum in Aberdeen, Maryland, this crew is restoring an almost extinct specimen, the German-built elephant. Only about 90 of them were ever produced. Now, only two are thought to be in existence. One in Russia, and this elephant right here. You don't run across a job like this very often. After a lot of hammering and sweat, Joe and his team are still trying to knock out the first track pin. As sometimes happens, the guys don't have the tool they need, so they make one up. You take some of these vehicles, they're so old, you'll never find the parts for them. They're like the tools to take off the wheels, so you have to do a lot of measuring and make the tools, all the special tools that we have, have been made. You can't buy them. We cut in the end of it, put a divot in the end of it, so it'll align on the pin here, keeps it centered as it drives through there. And that way, you know, it, it's a, it stays centered, it doesn't go off the track when, it, when it's driving through the pin. They're not sure the rod will work, but they're running out of options that won't wreck the track. Remember, this elephant doesn't come with any spare parts. We need that inside jack back on. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. Back off. Come on, baby. Six decades after she got knocked out of action, the elephant takes her first step back to recovery. Basically, that's the way you want the track to separate. It's not so easy all the time, though. Sometimes we get lucky and sometimes we have problems, as you see. That's the pin that came out of it. Been in there for 70 years. Still got bare metal there. The elephant can take this beating. After all, she was built to destroy other tanks. elephant came into being by chance, and it began life with a different name. It wasn't designed from the outset as a, a heavy tank destroyer. The Germans had tried to develop a new heavy tank, the Tiger, and had two competitive designs. One of the designs was produced by automotive engineer Ferdinand Porsche. His design did not win, but he had already manufactured some 90 chassis. In the middle of a world war, these were too precious to waste. They ended up with several of these hulls and said, well, we can't do anything with them. And Porsche said, well, you could stick an 88 millimeter gun and turn it into a gigantic heavy tank destroyer. And that's where it came from. In honor of her designer, the new tank destroyer was officially called the Ferdinand. She must have seemed indestructible. So that's what, a good eight inches, I should think. <coughs> Eight inches of armor, that's proof against most anything. 
drama-wise, this, this really is a beast. On paper, she was a work of art. But the Ferdinand hadn't been tested in battle. She was riddled with crippling design flaws. At the Battle of Kursk, the Germans would learn their tank destroyer was almost a sitting duck. July 1943, the Eastern Front. The greatest tank battle of all time. Two opposing forces were gathering in and around the city of Kursk. At Kursk, the Germans debut a whole slew of these new high-tech very powerful tanks, the, the, the Ferdinand, the, uh, the Tiger heavy tank, the Panther medium tank. Russian tanks couldn't match the Germans' highly sophisticated engineering. Instead, they relied on a simple concept, overwhelming quantity. The Germans only produced about 6,000 Panther tanks and some 1,800 of the Tiger I and Tiger II. As for the Elephant, roughly 90 were made. The Russians operated on a completely different scale. The Russians made somewhere between 65,000 and 85,000 T-34s. They don't know. They lost count. The Russian T-34 is nowhere near as technically as good as the German tanks in terms of firepower or armor. But on the other hand, there's thousands of them. That makes all the difference between victory and defeat in World War II. It rolls on tracks and boasts a mighty gun, but the elephant is not technically a tank. This does not have a turret. Uh, thus, it's a self-propelled uh, anti-tank gun or an assault gun. Today, the U.S. Army uses its own version of a self-propelled gun. This is the M109 Paladin Howitzer. At 25 metric tons, it weighs less than half as much as the Elephant. The Elephant and the Paladin are designed to engage the enemy from as far away as possible. If you go back as far as World War One and before, the aim of the field artillery was pretty much just to put a lot of high explosive downrange and uh, pretty much obliterate anything that uh, was down there. Now in the modern battlefield, we've taken into consideration collateral damage a lot more and our munitions are incredibly more accurate than they used to be, even as far as 20 years ago. Fort Hood, Texas. The U.S. Army is training artillery crews to destroy targets that are completely out of sight. Still joining the time. I just spent uh, 15 months in the uh, country of Iraq in a place called Bakuba. And this unit has shot over 6,000 rounds of artillery against uh, any any enemy that has uh, desired the will to die for his country. And uh, in the words of the uh, regimental motto, can and will, this battalion can and will take care of its own and kill the enemy in great numbers. It may look like a lumbering giant, but the M109 can be whipped into action with lethal speed. Our howitzers now can receive a mission, and within 90 seconds, they can put rounds down range. Compared to the elephant's top speed of 30 kilometers, or 19 miles per hour, the Paladin can hit close to double that. But the difference in speed pales to the superiority in firepower. The elephant used an 88mm gun, which had an effective range of about 2,000 meters. The M109 can hit targets in another country. We can fire the Excalibur round from over 20 kilometers away, uh, and we can hit targets with as much accuracy as pinpointing a room in a house that we want to put the round into. And one mission, I fired over 300 rounds one night from two different locations at targets that were within 400 meters of friendly troops. That's uh, so what we like to call danger close. The modern artillery battery is a highly complex communication rig that relies on muscle, brains, and razor-sharp eyes. Any artillery is only as good as the observers locking in on targets. For artillery, we uh, prefer uh, human eyes on target. A lot of things can happen over time, and uh, making those decisions, you need an observer on the ground. 
they are out actually spotting the enemy, and they call us, the Fire Direction Center. They let us know where they are. And once we have that information, we take that information and uh, compute firing data and send it to our guns, which we like to refer to as the muscle of the field artillery. The big thing about fire is, you know, we're we kind of shape the battlefield, we can attack in depth. Direction 4, 4, zero, zero, out. In combat, if we're using these, we use it against uh, troops in the open or uh, light-skinned vehicles uh, going across open ground. Uh, you don't have to be uh, right on target because uh, the kill radius of uh, 155 millimeter shells uh, about 150 meters, and then the uh, main radius goes out from there. These guns shoot with that much accuracy. Infantry and armor guys that are uh, calling in these rounds have that confidence in us and our equipment that we can deliver those uh, munitions safely. Back at the Ordnance Museum, the team has finally wrenched out the rusted pins. It's one of the largest ones we've done. We've done them one earlier when I was here, but uh, this is one of the larger ones. Built to handle the barbed wire and trenches of World War I, tracks remain a defining feature of the modern tank. At the JSMC plant in Lima, Ohio, these tracks are being manufactured for the U.S. Army's main battle tank, the M1 Abrams. Just over 16 meters long, these tracks weigh roughly 200 metric tons each. The Abrams tracks need to be able to handle its top speed of 30 miles per hour in a variety of conditions. With the tracks gone, Joe and the boys are surging ahead on the massive overhaul. Coming up, they discover the front left sprocket is jammed, but freeing up the wheel will uncover the mystery of what took the giant beast down. At the U.S. Army Ordnance Museum in Maryland, this elephant tank destroyer is getting cleaned up. Right now we're setting up and getting the game plan on how to remove all the road wheels so we can remove all the grease from the bearings and stuff. The elephant has to get prepped for priming and paint job. This means using a water gun to remove decades of grease, rust, and grime. With the water, I can blast all that off. It's going to go on the floor. I'll wash it off into the trench. Tomorrow there won't be any. We'll be working with clean metal. I'll blast this way. These water hoses are not your usual garden variety. They tear off more than just old paint. It'll cut right through concrete. Uh, it'll chew anything up, including your body. Unfortunately, it got a little too close to me and uh, I lost part of my foot. Uh, a couple skin grafts later, they were able to uh, put my heel back together. As Joe says, you dance with it. And once you get it uh, dancing down, it you know goes along real easy. As this elephant's history of dirt is washed clean. Thousands of miles away in England, her dreaded enemy is alive and well. This is a restored T-34. For many military historians, one of the greatest tanks of all time. The best tank in World War II has got to be the T-34. The T-34 was the tank in World War II. And the reason is it was a revolutionary step forward in the, the holy trinity of tank design. The holy trinity is armor, firepower, and mobility. The T-34 weighed 29.2 tons, exactly half that of the elephant. It was comparatively lightly armored, but carried a respectable 76.2 millimeter tank gun. Its 12-cylinder diesel engine put out 500 horsepower, giving it a top speed of over 50 kilometers per hour and a range almost five times that of the elephant cross-country. When the T-34 appeared, 
the, the Germans were shocked. Just shocked that the, that the Russians had this vehicle. It was so good. You could find tanks that had as much armor. You could find tanks that had as much firepower. You could find tanks that were as mobile. But you couldn't find any tanks that blended all three critical values. This T-34 is in the care of Peter Plume at the Imperial War Museum, Duxford, England. Uh, it took about um, five seconds in the back of a T-34 to get that dirty, yes. The T-34 wasn't uh, necessarily the easiest tank to work on, uh, but at the time tanks weren't expected to have a life expectancy more than a few weeks, so the chances of an engine blowing up and needing fixing weren't uh, as high as the tank being knocked out completely. Just reading accounts of uh, what the Germans thought of it during the war and the terror that it obviously caused them at the time um, makes me want to find out more about the tank and that's basically what got me interested in the first place. There's something incredibly sexy about driving a T-34 and um, thinking about some of the the crew that used to have to drive it during the war. This is the real thing, yeah. It is now week three of the five-week elephant restoration. The team tackles the massive wheels on the elephant. Each side has six road wheels, one idler, and one drive wheel. Each road wheel weighs about 113 kilos. And yes, getting them off is as hard as it looks. Those road wheels, sometimes they have a mind of their own and, and you get them on the shop floor and you turn your back and it'll just start moving. And the next thing you know, it's on the back of your leg. You know, you know Leroy had an incident where one almost got on him, but luckily it fell the other way. Stripped of her wheels, the elephant is now ready to be drained of her toxic fluids. This means getting low down and working underneath tons of rusted steel. Once these tanks are put in place to be put on display, they don't want a whole lot of oil and grease and all that leaking out of them to contaminate the soil. And the elephant might still contain other leftovers even more toxic than old oil. We have to check and see if the, uh, the gauges in them have uh, tritium in them. So they do a radioactive check and make sure there's no chemicals or anything like that in the paint. Well, we're in the process of draining fluids right now. And there's uh, two access plates, armor plates underneath. We aren't exactly which, which plates to take off. So we're in the process now of taking one of the bigger plates off to see what's above that. The entire rusted hulk is being held up by a few blocks of wood. We use 50 ton air jacks to jack these tanks up. Uh, one on the back, one on the front. And we have a variety of uh, wood blocking that we use. One thing about wood, it you will compress it not more than what it is. That's why they use it for cribbing. I've had five million pounds up on wooden blocks. You know, besides that, I'm skinny. Yeah, if you were scared, you'd get hurt. That's what happens most of the time. What does that do? Years the fake one. <laughs> 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 I owe somebody something. I'm sorry, I'll catch a live one and give it to you. I'll be right there. There is no time for fun and games. The boys are on a deadline. That's how, that's how it keeps us working, man. We got evidence now. No, we're talking about that right there. Cattle That's when he walks around and gets us with. Now we got if, you. If they don't do what they're told, <laughs> guaranteed they won't, won't do it again. It hurts, hurts like hell, too. Yes, yeah, look at the marks all over our necks and stuff. Look. Okay. I've got movement everywhere. 
is ready for another blast from the high-pressure hose. She was built to be a nightmare on tracks, but on the battlefield in action, all her flaws were quickly revealed. Even her strengths turned into deadly weaknesses. It's, it's armored up. I mean, this thing is armored up against most anything. So it, it protected the crew very well. It has great gun on it, so it has great firepower. The problem is mobility. Because it was so big, this is 70-something tons combat loaded, it just couldn't move around the battlefield well at all. And while the elephant may have had a super gun to knock out T-34s, it had no machine gun to deal with smaller human targets. Courageous Soviet troops could run up, throw on a Molotov cocktail, perhaps a sticky mine, disable or destroy the elephant tank. Another limitation, the elephant did not have a turret, so the amazing gun could not swivel independently of the chassis. And because the, the, the gun sits up there in that big superstructure, it has very limited traverse. You have to, in fact, turn the entire vehicle if you want to track a target. So if you have a Russian T-34 coming at you straight on, not a problem. But if, if they're coming around one side, you, you literally have to move the vehicle around. The Elephant was not built to roam the battlefield. This big gun was meant to sit back and fire from great distances. The concept of this vehicle is that they needed to shoot Russian tanks at long ranges. Self-propelled tank destroyers like the Elephant tend to operate in what is known as direct mode. Direct mode means you have your enemy directly in view. They hit only what they can see. The 88 millimeter gun uh, that's on this vehicle, in theory, can shoot about four kilometers. And actually, what you're looking at when you look through the scope of this thing at four kilometers and you put the crosshair, the crosshair covers the target at, at that point. So it's sort of guessing. Like the elephant, the paladin is meant to engage the enemy from afar. But with the paladin, there is no guesswork. The observers do the math and the gunners deliver the payload. The target doesn't stand a chance. Unlike the elephant, the M109 howitzer fires in the indirect mode, which means it does not directly see its target. To complete the equation, gun crews need to be able to communicate with each other. One of the most accurate and lethal guns in the world, the M109 is built on a connected web of information. There are eyes, the eyes of the field artillery, they are out actually spotting the enemy, and they call us, the Fire Direction Center, and they let us know where they are. And once we have that information, we take that information and uh, compute firing data and send it to our guns, which we like to refer to as the muscle of the field artillery. When the elephant made it to the U.S. Ordnance Museum, she came as is. No backup parts, no spares. Even a small piece of the 65-ton mammoth has to be accounted for and replaced. I'm in the process of uh, repairing a hinge that was cut, torched off the tank. Um, it's about a three-quarter inch crack. I took three, uh, two three-eighths pieces of metal, welded them together, and in process I had to groove it first so I can weld it between it so I get more penetration. Once I'm done with this piece, it'll look like it's brand new, right out of the factory. Two weeks to go. The elephant has been stripped of her tracks, water blasted, primed for paint. Locked up. That's why it was so hard to move around. It's like having the brakes on. 
When the boys wrench free the damaged sprocket, they discover two pieces of shrapnel. Two pieces that will help reveal the mystery of what brought this elephant down. Well, as uh, Joe and the rest of the crew were trying to put the sprocket back on the left side of the, of the elephant, well, that's when they discovered these two fragments. At first, the museum team is puzzled. Could they belong to the elephant? Looking at this first, with oh, these fragments, we, we, we're not going to be able to tell much from this. It's just only two small pieces. But Dr. Joe Rayner and his team discover the small fragments are not just scrap, they're vital clues, a direct link to the elephant's demise. This is probably the round that disabled the elephant and led to its uh, abandonment by the Germans. The fragments come from a round of ammunition, but who delivered the death blow? Up next, how the tank destroyer was knocked out of the war and saved for good. Less than two weeks to go, the tank crew at the U.S. Army Ordnance Museum is in the home stretch. The elephant hasn't looked this good since 1944. While Joe, Rich, and Leroy were draining the tank and blasting it, Anthony was in the next room building missing pieces. He built the running boards, the fenders, and the, and the side panels there on both sides. So we put those on. This was cut loose with a torch. That uh, gun mount, it just, we just put that on there. He had to weld it, and there's two access panels in the front up there, which are three-quarter inch steel. Even after the main overhaul, the elephant still has some visible battle scars. If you notice on the gun barrel, that one round hit here. We don't repair that damage. What we do is after we get it put together, we highlight it with a, uh, aluminum paint, a silver paint, so it can be seen from a distance and show exactly where it's at without having to hunt for it. At Kursk, the tank destroyer was a disaster. Its complex engineering was a major liability. The majority of the losses weren't combat losses. The majority of the losses were the vehicle simply broke down, they couldn't be repaired, they were heavy, awkward design. Two weeks of savage fighting end in Russian victory, but the cost is horrific. It is estimated that 250,000 Soviet troops were killed, 600,000 wounded, 100,000 Germans were killed or wounded, half the German tanks were knocked out of action. German forces began a long retreat to ultimate defeat. The flawed Ferdinand, those that survived, were sent back to the design table. This is why all the Ferdinands were eventually sent to the Nibelungen Works in Austria to be refitted with a battle machine gun to have some sort of inherent firepower against attacking enemy infantry. Protective grills were placed over the engines. A commander's cupola was added to the turret. A non-conductive coating called Zimmerit was applied to the hull. This would make it more difficult for magnetic mines to stick on. Refitted, reworked, the Ferdinand was now renamed the Elephant. And in 1944, it was sent on its final mission. The first company of the 653rd Elephant Battalion was rushed from the Nibelungen Works in Austria to the Italian front in order to counter the American and British invasion of the Anzio Beachhead. January 1943, the Italian campaign. The Allies wanted to break through heavily fortified German lines and reach Rome. They launched an amphibious assault, landing some 36,000 troops on the coastal town of Anzio, about 50 kilometers south of Rome. German forces were initially surprised but hit back hard. The death toll was massive. 
by the time the Italian campaign was over, the, the first company of the, of the 653rd limped out of Italy with only three functioning vehicles. The others were lost to engine fires, P-40 attacks, disabling hits on the treads that they couldn't recover. It was at Anzio that the Ordnance Museum's elephant was hit in the left front wheel. But the mystery remains, who or what took this tank out? Right in here is where the ROM hit, and that's what bent everything up. Long after the war, the disabling shot at her front left wheel is still holding up the overhaul. The sprocket is not going on properly. The battle damage is blocking a perfect fit. We try to line up the battle damage so when we were going on and coming off, everything would go back and forth the way it should. So it's a little off we would. You see it? Yeah. Come forward. Come forward. Okay. Now lock the brake down. Lock the brake. Well, the distance between the drum on this side, you said you bottomed out, but you didn't bottom out. You bottomed out. We locked up on the battle damage. The battle damage is actually holding us out about, I'd say, a half inch. Where, 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 the, where the inner drum is, we're going to have to cut that out. We're definitely going to have to do something about it. Time to bring in Anthony. We had an up cut the piece of the brake drum out piece of the um, backing plate off. It just made for a, a lot harder job than we were actually anticipating. Eventually, all the wheels are put back in place. The team now has to thread the tracks over the wheels. Whoa! Whoa! The hard part now, now that we got the track underneath the tank, now we gotta pull the other end over the rear sprocket. I'll be out this I'll do show the thing on there. Hook onto it with either track jacks or come alongs, and then put the pin in. And sometimes that is that is uh, quite difficult. Come on, baby, don't do it. Don't do it. She's not in the sprocket. Hold him up. He's not in the sprocket. Tighten it up, pull it up in the groove, and spin it, the side's done. Coming up, a lot more muscle, a boatload of painting, and a serious fender bender. There goes my f***ing job. Built for war, this tank destroyer has been broken, rebuilt, and blasted. Now she's ready for a paint job. All she needs now is camo. Well, we'd like to take a camouflage pattern and look like how it was painted when it was in Italy in service just before it's captured by the U.S. Army Ordnance Technical Intelligence Team in about late May 1944. Right now I'm just sketching everything in with red. You're not supposed to be seeing this because this is cheating. But as close as replica as I can make of this pattern, I'm going to make it. And, uh, Hopefully it's what they like. <clears throat> you don't like doing it twice. <laughs> While she gets her final coat, the museum team continues hunting for answers. Well, we looked through our extensive ammo collection and found the M61, which is a perfect fit for this. It fits just right in there on that threading you can see. This lets the team narrow in on which Allied ordnance took the elephant out. 
So this is essentially the type of round that took out our elephant tank, or at least disabled it. There's a whole lot of different vehicles in the, in the catalog of American tanks of 1944 that could have fired this. Might have been a Sherman, might have been an M10. Now, was it shot at by other things? Probably so. But I think most of this damage on this vehicle was done by a Sherman with a 75 millimeter gun. Once the elephant was captured, it was identified by the uh, technical intelligence team of the Ordnance Department as something to be exploited for its technical intelligence. The elephant's short-lived combat career was now over. Five weeks after this monumental overhaul began, the elephant is finally picture perfect. She's good to go, ready for the big move to her place of honor at the museum. But if getting her in was tough, getting her out is going to be even tougher. This is a big moment for the whole crew. They have every reason to be proud. The, uh, probably about one of the hardest ones that we ever done here, I have ever done here. They're all a hard challenge because they're so old. But right when you think the job is done, Something can go terribly wrong. Oh! Oh, my right there goes my pay job. Damn it! Nobody was communicating. Uh, you seen all the guys with their orange hats on? When he puts his hands up like that, that means everything stops. Because he's in control. Not a good thing when it's only gone 25 or 30 feet, and all of a sudden you've got a scratch paint job. Come on, Sergeant. Hope it gets a little bit better than this. Quick. Firewood, baby. Give me that firewood. They've got to control the tank. Some wood blocks are shoved in to slow it down, but the tank ignores the wood. And they're having trouble with the wheels because the chassis is designed to lift over obstructions in the track. All this effort, and they haven't even got the elephant onto the trailer. They still have to haul the 71-ton monster to the museum grounds. I don't think that's going to go on there, Rich. The elephant weighs much more than the trailer she's clambering onto. It's like a tow truck hauling a freight train. Finally, the elephant stops resisting and is pulled off solid ground. She's only one of two left in the world. She's traveled 4,000 miles across two continents and survived the greatest tank battle of all time. Finally, the elephant can stand proud with the other treasures at one of the world's greatest tank museums. Thanks to the dedication of this tank crew. I can't say enough about the finished product. Uh, I think it's going to be a very uh, uh, exciting piece for the museum to have. It will bring a lot of folks in to see it. The day's done, and you've told you know talked to people, and you know they're real happy with what you've done, and you're real happy with what you've done. It's very fulfilling. I love to see the finished product once it's done. My favorite is knowing what we've done to it, how it looks when it leaves out of here. But it is very rewarding when you see a rusted piece of equipment come in here, and. When it leaves here, it looks really, really good because we did do a good job here. It was a team effort from, from start to get, uh, and that's the only way that it did come together. And it came out really nice. Uh, it was some long hours, and uh, we were happy to make sure it got done. In the end, I love it.
For the crew at the U.S. Army Ordnance Museum, there is no rest. Their job is never really done, and that's just the way they like it. No, look, there's another one over there. Look, Rich, that one's waiting for you. And then the one next to it, that's another one. Yeah. <laughs> 